Ready? All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our first virtual Rebel Recharge Lecture of 2023. We have a great lineup of engaging and educational talks that we are very excited to share with all of you. Um, you can see our full schedule of events at engage.unlv.edu forward slash events. Uh, my name is Blake Douglas. I'm the executive director of the UNLV Alumni Association. And on behalf of the more than 144,000 UNLV alumni, it's my pleasure to welcome each of you here today. I'd also like to take a moment to give a special welcome and a thank you to Renee rivera Gelfi, our associate director for programs and events. Um, Rebel Recharges are Renee's uh, uh, a baby, if you will, and she produces those and does a fine job. So Renee, thank you for the work that you do here. Um, for these events. Our virtual, our next virtual Rebel Recharge will take place on Friday, February the 10th. An anthropologist goes looking for love in all the old places. Professor, Professor William uh, Jenkowick will provide an overview of his journey to understand what love is and how it has shaped the human experience. So it should be a fascinating, fascinating talk. Our goal is to continue to grow these programs and create a fun, educational, and engaging opportunities for our alumni, faculty, staff, students, and community members. Today's presentation is entitled, How to Stress Less and Cope with Life Changes More Effectively, presented by Dr. Manjo Sharma. Dr. Sharma is a professor and chair of the School of, of the, sorry, Professor of Social and Behavioral Health Programs in the School of Public Health here at UNLV. He has degrees from the University of, um, of Delhi and The Ohio State University. His career has spanned more than 30 years at 13 national and international universities, and he has published 13 books and secured funding in the range of $8 million. Amongst his many honors is the American Public Health Association's Mentoring Award and the William R. Uh, Gima Distinguished Alumnus Award. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sharma. Thank you so much, uh, Blake, for your uh, kind words of introduction. And uh, I will uh, I welcome all the participants and let me share my screen so I can uh, begin uh, the presentation. So my presentation, as Blake mentioned, is about stressing less and coping with life challenges more effectively. So there are key two key words. One is a stress, the other one is coping. And that is one of my areas of research and specialization, stress and coping. So uh, I have a message uh, on the very first page which says it is not the stressor, but your perception of the stress that is important. So that is the message I want to uh, convey throughout my presentation. And uh, this is... Uh, the byline that I want all of you to remember more on lines with what William Shakespeare said, that thinking makes it so. Uh, nothing is good or bad. Thinking makes it so. So the same thing applies when it comes to any stressor that we face in our life. So here are the objectives of my presentation. First of all, we will learn how to uh, define a stress, a stressors, and types of stressors. Then we will describe the contemporary models uh, that explain stress and coping. We will talk about coping and types of coping. And then we will delve right into the various kinds of uh, concrete techniques or uh, uh, methods by which we can uh, reduce stress and cope effectively with life challenges. You can ask me questions at any point during my presentation because uh, Rene mentioned that we are not uh, strictly bound by one hour. So even if the session needs to go a little longer, we can do so. So feel free to interrupt me. And uh, you can also post your uh, 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 questions in the chat if you like, and Rene is monitoring those. So she can also uh, uh, ask those questions or comments that you have. So uh, my first uh, uh, question to all of you, because uh, I, as uh, Blake mentioned, I'm a professor. So I like to ask questions, the Socratic method. So my question to you is, you know, what is a stress and what are things that cause you stress? So you can answer either one of those questions and we will talk about these. So any uh, brave uh, people in the audience, want to share their stressors, like what causes them stress, 
or what is on their mind which is causing them some stress today. You can unmute yourself and uh, mention or you can type in the chat. We have one in the chat says emotional and physical tension. Okay, that is an excellent uh, uh, kind of an answer, which is uh, 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 in terms of defining stress. In the subsequent slide, we will talk about both stress and strain. So uh, uh, that, that's a, a pretty good uh, uh, response to the question, what is the stress? Now, what are some things that uh, cause that kind of a uh, turmoil? We also have money or lack thereof causes stress. Oh, absolutely. Money, uh, both less and excessive money also, I would add, causes stress. And this is uh, like uh, 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 we will talk about various types of stressors. And uh, it can become a uh, uh, daily hassle for some people, especially students who are on a tight budget, you know, or it can be a, a, a more like a chronic strain, uh, uh, or it can be an, uh, a persistent life difficulty. So uh, any of those categories, this issue of money can fall into, but it's uh, more uh, often seen as a chronic stressor. So what I'm coming to is that there are two types of stressors, acute and chronic. Acute meaning uh, immediate, and chronic meaning long term. So, can you think of uh, any other sources of stress? Um, the next one is raising children and the unknown. Too many high expectations from others. Ec excellent points. Yeah. So, uh, uh, raising children is what is known as a role is trained. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, being in a particular role causes a strain or multiplicity of uh, roles that can cause uh, stress and uh, 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 expectations. Yes, that is a very important thing because uh, we often uh, uh, tend to have expectations from others uh, uh, that such and such person will behave in such and such way. And an easy way to cope with that is to not have expectations, right? So we will talk about that also. So any other uh, uh, things in the chat? Uh, workload that can feel unmanageable. Absolutely. So we talked about that role is strain. Uh, being in a particular role can cause uh, stress. So that is uh, another source of uh, stress. So I think that is a, a good sample of uh, various stressors and I will elaborate on some of these further. So let us first talk about what do we mean by stress? So stress is a response of the body, of the mind, and it can also manifest in our behaviors. So by body, we mean various physical symptoms, like a person can get a headache, can uh, uh, get uh, musculoskeletal pains. Uh, in the mind, we uh, our, uh, one of the audience members already mentioned that it can cause emotional tension, it can cause a strain. So that is in the mind, you know, anxiety, depression, those kind of manifestations can happen. In terms of behavior, sometimes we, uh, as a result of a stress, we indulge in negative behaviors. For example, uh, smoking or drinking or eating too much, excessive eating, that a uh, number of uh, studies have shown that stress is linked to uh, eating behavior. So it can uh, 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 result in on, uh, all of those. And the result uh, uh, or the causation of stress is the stressors, which are the environmental events. So anything happening in the environment and interpreting these events. Uh, the most important piece is how we interpret that message that I mentioned early on, that it is not the stressor, but the perception of the stressor by us that is important. The same stressor, one person may uh, uh, perceive it as a potential threat, 
Another person may perceive it as part of life. One person may think of it as a big problem. Another person may think of it as an opportunity. So that interpretation is very important and also is important is an assessment of the controllability. Oftentimes we get stressed when we imagine or the, the thing that you mentioned about expectation that it is beyond my control. The moment that feeling comes in, the stress level escalates or increases. So we will learn in this uh, presentation as to how to correctly interpret the stressors and how to make a realistic uh, assessment of the controllability of these stressors. <clears throat> so in common parlance, so one of the members of the audience mentioned the term strain. So stress is uh, the effect on the mind and strain in common parlance is on the musculoskeletal system. So some people may develop temporomandibular joint syndrome or aches and pains in the body, the unexplained aches and pains in the body. Those are all strains. And that is why some relaxation techniques are helpful for reducing strains, uh, like uh, practicing yoga or uh, tai chi or uh, other uh, flexibility or uh, aerobic exercise. We will not delve too much with the strain aspect in this presentation, but we will delve more on the effects of stressors on the mind, because we are talking about stress and coping. So that is why we will not, uh, uh, that is another total uh, presentation, new presentation on relaxation techniques. And that is more of a practical kind of an, uh, presentation. Uh, and I do uh, several uh, workshops on yoga and relaxation and things like that also. And then, so coming to the types of stressors, uh, uh, unfortunately, none of you mentioned these uh, acute life events or li uh, once in a while kind of events, which can be recent or remote. Uh, by this, we mean things like getting into an accident. God forbid uh, that, that doesn't happen to any one of you. But if it happens, then that is a once in a while kind of an event. And it is discrete, observable, and objectively reportable. Or uh, having a marriage, that is a, uh, also a positive kind of a thing, you know, uh, but uh, uh, it is once in a while uh, kind of an event. For most people, it is once in a lifetime, but for some others, you know, it can be more frequent. But uh, nonetheless, it is not uh, hundreds of times that you get married, right? So it is uh, both uh, good and bad events in the environment can cause us stress. Likewise, divorce or bankruptcy or uh, things like that, uh, both positive and negative events or diagnosis with a chronic, uh, with a major uh, illness. So that can be uh, all uh, these life events and they can uh, cause problems which we will see. Or these can sometimes be remote, like what happens in post-traumatic stress disorder. As a child, you were uh, abused and that memory is haunting you. So that can also cause a stress or people who go on wars. Uh, I was just listening to the news and there have been like uh, at an average over the last few years, uh, 6,000 uh, veterans who commit suicide every year. So that's a substantial number of Su uh, suicides by veterans. So that is a, a cause of uh, stress because of the trauma that they experienced of being in a war zone or uh, uh, being away from the family, seeing other people suffer, die, uh, uh, having the various kinds of uh, 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 hardships associated with war. So the more common categories are the chronic stressors. And uh, those can be classified as persistent life difficulties. Persistent life difficulty is when one life event persists more than six months. For example, you are in an accident and as a result of that accident, you are paralyzed. So that becomes a persistent life difficulty. Or role is strained. And we talked about that, like parenting or working or being in a relationship. Those are all role strains. And then chronic strains, these are uh, uh, being part of a social group. And all of us are uh, uh, minorities in one respect or the other. 
in one forum or the other forum, you know. So just being a minority uh, by virtue of your race, you know, uh, uh, in any group or ethnicity can be a source or by your sexual orientation or by uh, uh, any other parameter, you can be a minority just because you have an opinion about something and rest of the people have a different opinion. Uh, like, for example, I like to be considered as a world citizen. Uh, in uh, my WhatsApp group with my schoolmates, I tell them that I'm a world citizen. And they say, well, uh, you, you, uh, you are an American citizen and you don't understand uh, 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 the intricacies of uh, the ground realities in India. Many of them are in India. So we, you can, uh, in a very comfortable situation, call yourself a world citizen. But uh, so that kind of a dialogue we have. So that is a, a kind of a chronic strain. You can be a minority viewpoint in any majority group. And then daily hassles like traffic or standing in a queue or a line. And then there are community-wide strains. Uh, just uh, recently, uh, two of my students, uh, they went on uh, the winter break and in their apartment, a homeless person started living. So when they returned, they were in a lot of stress. So just because you are in a high crime neighborhood, that can be stressful to you. So th those are the various kinds of chronic stressors. Now, what do you think uh, are acute uh, stressors more common or chronic stressors more common? And which are more harmful? Are the acute stressors more harmful uh, or chronic stressors more harmful? Anybody wants to unmute themselves and say or type in the chat? So no brave people, right? Uh, we so have a couple that says chronic. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yes, chronic stressors tend to be more harmful than the uh, uh, acute stressors. And then are we missing some other category of stressors besides acute and chronic? Yes, we are. And that is what we call as the non-events. And one of the most common non-event is getting bored. We cannot uh, uh, tolerate our own company. So the moment we are alone, we cannot handle our alone time. And we start uh, fidgeting with our cell phone these days, which is very popular. Or uh, we start calling a friend or we start reading something, getting busy. So getting bored is a non-event. Another form of a non-event is when events that we anticipate, which is more in line with expectations that you were mentioning. Those expectations that we have from ourselves or others, when they do not occur, then that causes also stress in us. For example, you want to graduate, but uh, uh, all your friends have graduated. And uh, uh, you do not have enough, you uh, were a little lax and you did not take adequate number of courses and you are not graduating. So that is causing you stress. Or uh, uh, sometimes some desirable events uh, that are uh, occurring uh, for your age group, uh, for your demographic uh, group are not occurring for you. So there could be, for example, all your friends have gotten married, but you are the only single person. So that may cause you stress. So there's nothing actually happening. It's a non-event, but it is potentially causing you some amount of uh, distress. There are two kinds of stress, distress and eustress. Distress is the bad stress. Eustress is the good stress. Sometimes the stressors are good for you. Like, for example, pressure of exams. Uh, so you prepare uh, and you do well in the, those exams. Or there's a pressure of submission of a uh, grant proposal. And you work on that and you submit that grant proposal. You get the money. So that's a good stress. So stress can be both good and bad. And we will uh, go back to our definition of a stressor is how we interpret it 
and how we make an assessment of the controllability. So let us look at how the concept of stress has uh, 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 evolved over the years. So initially, you know, we had uh, in 1930s, we had uh, the uh, physiological kind of an interpretation of a stress, which was known as the response-based model. And the term stress originated from engineering, where we had uh, various kinds of uh, stress fractures of uh, uh, the uh, various bridges and so on. So there was a physiologist, Walter Cannon, he worked with animal models and he uh, talked about the fight or flight response. So he would poke uh, some animals with a uh, pin or a needle and uh, yeah, either the rat will fly, uh, fly away from that uh, irritant stimulant or will fight against it, will growl or come back. So that type of a response, he said that when you were uh, subjected to various kinds of uh, stimuli, we either fight or fly. And that type of a response uh, is also common with humans in the, at the very basic level. And uh, Hans Selye, a Su Swedish physiologist, he talked about the general uh, adaptation syndrome. Uh, and uh, he said that initially there is an alarm reaction. The person is, to uh, the animal was totally alarmed and then tries to resist it. And then finally gives up. There is a stage of exhaustion. So, uh, and he coined these terms, use stress and distress, which I already explained to you in my previous slide. So the second model, which psychologists, so physiologists, they were more interested in the hormones and the neurotransmitters and uh, the physiology of things. And then came the psychologists, Richard Rahe and Thomas Holmes. They took a totally psychological or a uh, mind and emotion perspective to it, and they developed a social readjustment rating scale that had 43 events. And these were all acute life events like divorce, like accident, like illness and things like that. And they said that uh, uh, based on that, they calculated a life change unit score. And this found that uh, people with a range of 150 to 199 had a 37% chance leading to disease in the next year, 51% if it was higher and uh, over 379%. Uh, there were some issues with this because uh, the disease was also listed as a stressor. So that uh, chicken and egg kind of a situation was a problem in this type of conceptualization. But nonetheless, we started looking at some of these acute life events more carefully. And then uh, we had the interactional model by uh, Lazarus. Uh, in the 80s, he talked about primary appraisal. So whenever we are confronted by something in the environment, we say, well, uh, am I okay or am I in trouble? So that is where the interpretation part that we were talking about in the definition of a stress comes into interplay. And this uh, can be based on our past experience, knowledge about uh, ourselves. For example, if I am told to run a marathon, I would immediately get into a lot of stress because I know myself that I barely do exercise. So I will not be able to run a marathon. So uh, uh, that will uh, be immediately, uh, I will say I'm in trouble. And then uh, about uh, events like uh, uh, what is entailed uh, in this particular uh, stressor. So that assessment and influence uh, from others and the, or influence on others. Well, such and such person reacted with this stressor and had a bad time. So do I really want to do this? Uh, 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 so that kind of a comparative or vicarious learning can also uh, be uh, done in the primary appraisal. And then secondary appraisal is controllability assessment, which we talked about, that how much control I have over this threat. If I say that uh, I am in control, then it doesn't proceed any further. However, if I say that I am under, uh, 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 I do not have control, then the stress levels start mounting. And that is where the coping comes into interplay, which is the application 
of how I'm going to deal with it. And then uh, reappraisal happens, which is uh, after applying that coping, we uh, reassess the situation, whether we've been able to uh, negate the negative or the effects of distress or not. So let us uh, talk about what is coping and what are some examples of coping. So once again, I open it up to the audience for uh, their responses uh, for uh, 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 what do you think is coping? Uh, uh, how, how do we do coping? Can you share some examples? Suppose you have a rela relationship and that relationship is not working. So uh, how, how will you cope with that particular situation? We have one comment that came in and said, figure out ways to deal with or work around these challenges. Okay, that is an excellent uh, perspective. So you will uh, think about how to solve this particular stressor that is known as problem solving, or you will exercise your cerebral cortex. You know, in physiology, we have the cerebral cortex, which is responsible for higher order thinking. And we have the limbic system, which is the uh, slightly lower part of the, uh, uh, in the middle, mid brain it is located, which is responsible for the emotions or the feelings. So those are the two types of uh, parts of the brain that we use in coping. So anybody wants to think about uh, uh, how we can use the uh, emotional part of our uh, brain to uh, cope with a potential stressor. Um, another comment says, find supportive relationship, lower expectations, take responsibility for certain situations, negotiate. Excellent. So this is uh, uh, find su uh, su uh, support that is uh, using the emotional part because you know your person you're talking to would uh, probably say, well, it's not a big deal or uh, others are also experiencing it or uh, so, uh, give some sort of an emotional counsel to you. Uh, so that is uh, an emotional way. And the other response which you gave was more in terms of the problem uh, based uh, uh, or problem focused type of coping. So let us delve a little deeper into these two uh, mechanisms of coping. So let us talk about the concept of coping. So the concept of stress, it came in 30s, but the concept of coping did not come in the literature until the 60s. It was in late 60s that we started talking about coping. And the word uh, uh, copus uh, comes from colpus, meaning to alter. So we are essentially trying to alter our perception of the stressor. If we can alter the stressor, then that is also fine. But most of the time that a stressor is going to be there. Like for example, you have a, a deadline coming up. The deadline is going to be there. You cannot alter that deadline, but you can alter your perception and your preparation and your uh, other uh, dimensions to it. So uh, dealing with and attempting to overcome problems and difficulties, that is uh, the core of coping part that uh, we uh, take these uh, stressors and uh, uh, take them as challenges and we find means to overcome them. So in psychology, it can be used as a thought process. It can be a personality characteristic. We can say this person is more resilient than the other person. Uh, this person can handle a lot of stress. So that is a personality characteristic. Or it can be in the social context. Like for example, you see in Ukraine, there is a war going on, but still uh, pre the president Zelensky is not giving up you know, they're, they're being bombarded with a lot of uh, uh, firepower, but uh, yeah, that, that is in a social context that they are coping despite all odds. So that is the kind of a, uh, uh, at a larger social level also, we can conceptualize coping. 
And uh, so uh, we mentioned that it was in the late 60s that this concept of coping came about. So like I mentioned, there are two mechanisms of coping. Problem-focused coping is based on thinking, higher order functions. This is endowed uh, upon only to humans. Only humans have the capability to think. No other uh, uh, organism in the uh, 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 on our planet has that capability because we are the only ones with sophisticated cerebral cortex. We have higher order functions. And then emotion focused coping. And uh, this is uh, the way where we can alter the feeling about a situation. So uh, that is, uh, uh, of course, a number of animals also feel, you know, our pet dog also has feelings. You can see uh, one day our dog is sad or uh, not so enthusiastic. And then we pat him on the back, uh, he becomes very enthusiastic. And uh, so that feeling level is there in various animals also. So problem-focused coping, some of the thought process examples are problem-solving skills, conflict resolution, advice seeking, all these you mentioned, time management, uh, goal setting, uh, gathering information about what is causing stress. So all those you can do for at the thought process level. Uh, at the behavioral action level, you can join, for example, a smoking cessation class, uh, following a uh, prescribed medical treatment, adherence to a diabetic diet plan, scheduling and prioritizing tasks for managing time. So behaviors, we mean concrete actions that we can take. So you can think about something and then you can implement it into an action. So that is the problem-focused coping. And then emotion-focused coping is at the thought process or uh, limbic system level, is denying the existence of a stressful situation. We can say, well, I am not as stressed, which is often uh, what we do uh, with many of our uh, stressors, we deny. Or freely express emotions. Sometimes crying also helps. So you are freely expressing your uh, emotions or you are angry about a situation. These are all emotions. Not uh, all emotions are very healthy. So we have to uh, be very careful or avoiding this stressful situation, more on lines with the flight response that uh, 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 we talked about. And then making social comparisons. Well, everybody has this problem, or uh, I'm not the only one, or such and such is worse than me. So those kinds of emotional responses. And minimization of looking at the bright side of things. Well, everybody is uh, uh, got a C grade in this course. So this instructor is awful. So that's type of a response we can generate. And the behavioral response, like you mentioned about seeking social support, uh, use of exercise, relaxation, meditation, support groups. So all of those can help with the various kinds of uh, emotional uh, uh, actions. So let us now delve into some concrete techniques. And the first technique that I want to talk about is known as rational emotive therapy, R-E-T, developed by Albert Ellis out of New York. And there is a full uh, R-E-T-based counseling approach. So you don't have to pay a lot of money to counselors and you can be your own self counselors by following this particular technique. This is a self-help technique. You don't have to go to anybody, spend the money with a psychotherapist or a counselor and uh, learn the various basics. So it is the A, B, C, D, E technique. A is the activating system. So sit down, find a place, identify what is causing you stress. And then you explore what is the belief system. What, why is this stress coming up? Like, for example, somebody mentioned that uh, their uh, relationship of parenting is causing them stress. So the belief system may be that uh, your belief is that I want to be an ideal parent. I want to be loved all the time by my children. I want to be a perfectionist parent. Those may be your 
belief systems which may be causing these kinds of stress in your mind. So think of the effects of indulging in these irrational beliefs. Now, all those beliefs that I mentioned that you have to be perfect, that you have to be uh, loved by your children all the time, that you have to perform at your peak capability are irrational. Nobody can do that, right? So that is uh, uh, an expectation. Somebody mentioned about expectations. That is an unrealistic expectation of yourself. So if you keep on indulging, you will become frustrated, you will become angry, you will become uh, uh, all those negative kind of things will happen to you. So you think about all of those and then you start disputing irrational beliefs. You for apply a firm no and you exercise moderation. I am a good parent. I'm not a perfect parent, but I am moderately good. I, I can't. Uh, cannot be loved all the time by my child, but I can be loved at least modest, uh, moderately by uh, moderate times by my child. So applying moderation in everything, not being extreme in your judgment, and then enjoying the effect of the rational belief. So this is a very simple technique. All it requires is a downtime, quiet time instead of fidgeting on the cell phone. You can introspect and work on this rational emotive therapy and enjoy the beneficial effects. Now, here are examples of irrational beliefs, necessity to be loved by everybody. We talked about that, thoroughly competent. I need to be a thoroughly competent parent. We talked about that. Certain people are bad. Now your boss brings you to office, you know, for Renee, Blake calls her into her office and says he, he was having a bad day and says uh, you are good for uh, nothing, your project that you are working is totally useless. So Rene personalizes it and says Blake is a bad person. So that will create a lot of stress in her life. So instead of personalizing or labeling people as bad, she can say, well, today Blake's behavior to me was bad. And he, he, she can have a conversation with him when he is in a better mood that uh, uh, what, what you said about my work was little unprofessional or not uh, up to the mark or uh, uh, I can do such and such thing. So that, but labeling the person as completely bad is not going to be beneficial. Likewise, uh, it is awful and catastrophic when things are not the way one would very much like them to be. So minimizing the catastrophization Oh my God, if I don't meet this deadline, I, I will be fired. That is catastrophization. So uh, maybe if you talk to your boss, you know, uh, the boss will say, well, uh, yeah, we, we can miss the deadline this time, but don't miss it next time or something like that. Some uh, uh, solution can be found. And unhappiness is externally controlled. Now you have to remember that happiness is always internal. We choose to be happy. It is up to us to be happy. And coming back to our tagline on the very first slide, it is not the stressor, but the perception of the stressor by us that is important. So that type of a, uh, important reaffirmation that I am in charge of my happiness. No one else is. And then uh, if something bad is going to happen, you keep on dwelling on it. Oh my God, Las Vegas traffic is so bad. One of these days I'm going to be in an accident. So don't dwell on such negativity. Think of the positive aspects. And we will talk about optimism also later on in this presentation. So expression of rational beliefs, moderate evaluation of badness. It is not bad, it is bad, but not terrible. So doing moderation, like uh, in the earlier example that I shared with you with relationships, you try to be moderate in your disposition. Statements of toleration. I don't like Blake, but I can bear uh, Blake. Not to uh, badger on Blake, but uh, that, that is just, uh, I'm kidding. So Blake, please don't mind. So uh, acceptance of fallibility. Uh, I was wrong. I was wrong in uh, uh, pointing out uh, my example directed towards Blake. 
So I admit my mistake, I'm sorry. And then avoidance of extremes. Uh, often I do well instead of always I do well. So those extreme words always or never should be out of your dictionary. So you should not use those words in your uh, thinking. So this is the rational emotive therapy. Any questions on this particular methodology or technique before we move to the next one? Okay, so let's uh, go to the method based on simplified Kundalini Yoga, which is from the East. And that is also requires simple sitting down and thinking about the various thoughts or worries that are you are facing right now. So you can very easily take 20, 25 minutes of your time any day or once a week and start thinking or analyzing your, you jot down on a piece of paper, all that is worrying you. And then you can say, well, this is a worry that needs to be faced. For example, you have a disability that you have to endure. There is no cure for this disability, so that you have to endure. Then there are worries that should be solved immediately. For example, you have some money available to you, but you also have a credit card debt. You don't want to accrue that interest on your credit card. So you may want to pay off that debt as soon as possible so that it does not persist. Or worries that may be postponed. For example, you uh, uh, are at the age of marriage, but you have not been able to find an appropriate partner. So you can postpone that, uh, you keep on trying uh, uh, and uh, you can postpone that. It does not need to be solved right today. So you don't have to spoil your uh, uh, mental peace for the day. And then worries to be ignored. And this you would find would be the largest list. For example, somebody mentioned earlier expectations like other people, expectations, what do people think of me? So that type of a, a, a list uh, will grow. Like uh, you, you, most of the time we are uh, thinking, oh my God, uh, if I wear this type of a dress, what will others think of me? Nobody thinks about you. People are all the time engrossed in their own problems and issues and day-to-day -day issues. So they may uh, pay uh, cursory uh, glance at your dress and if it is totally uh, awkward, they may make a comment, but they will forget about it. In the long scheme of things, it is not going to be of much consequence. There is a book called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and it is all small stuff. So that, that philosophy we should uh, use in our approach. So that is another way of uh, dealing with it. Uh, if you want, you can try uh, rational emotive therapy. If you like simplified Kundalini yoga, you can apply this technique. And then there is another technique uh, which was developed by Frederick Peirce in 1969. This method is based on gestalt therapy. Gestalt is looking at the complete picture. It is a German word which says completeness or totality. So uh, it owes its origin in psychoanalysis and European phenomenology or existentialism and gestalt psychology. So you don't have to go to uh, expensive psy psychotherapists or counselors uh, to get that uh, counseling in gestalt approach. You can simply apply it here where you, uh, the basic principle is unity of self-awareness behavior and experience. So you focus on the present or now and be in touch with what is. Uh, uh, so the questions that you need to focus on are, where are you now? Suppose you are sitting down right now. So just sit, think about that particular moment and think of all those experiences that you're having, all the bodily sensations, all the thoughts that are arising in your mind, and then derive an awareness from that total 
picture, totality of uh, your awareness, you derive what kind of learning you are getting. So it's a little philosophical, but for some people, this approach works. So it is also a reflective process where you are thinking about the total uh, 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 sensations from all the five or six senses that we have and then deriving uh, a complete uh, picture. And then another method is based on systematic desensitization developed by Joseph Wolpe in 1958. And this is a more spatialized kind of a coping mechanism. This is for uh, if you have fear of something. Some people have a fear of a snake. Some people have a fear of uh, 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 lizards. Some people have a fear of a spider or those kinds of fears. So, so this is helpful in overcoming those type of stressors, which some people have fear of heights. So you have to break down the anxiety producing event in small steps. Suppose you have a fear of heights. So you say, well, uh, I will uh, start by planning a trip to the mountains. Uh, then I will book my tickets. Then I will go to the uh, airplane and then I will uh, land up in that city. And then I will uh, drive down to the mountain. And then I will, uh, uh, at each step you say, is this stressful? If it is stressful, you practice relaxation. So you develop a kind of a mechanism where you are replacing the uh, anxiety with the feeling of relaxation. So you keep on breaking it down. I have uh, now at the foot of the mountain and then I'm climbing the mountain. And so at each step, you visualize that step a priori or before the fact and then practice relaxation for each of those steps. And that is how you develop a fear hierarchy and couple it up with relaxation response. If needed, you also practice re mental relaxation at each step. So this is a little more specialized kind of a method. And then we have cognitive behavioral therapy and many of you have heard about the CBT. And once again, you do not have to go to an expensive counselor or a psychotherapist. You can apply it as a self-help technique. So this is the practical orientation toward problem solving. The problem-focused coping that we talked about, this is an application of that. So we have to find out the negativity in our thinking pattern. All of us have negative thoughts. So we have to find out what those negative thoughts are and then replace them with the positive kind of thoughts and put them into action. That is the behavioral part. The cognitive part is the thinking and the behavioral is the action part. So here are the steps. Identify a situation that is producing anxiety in your mind. Identify the thoughts behind this anxiety. Identify the automatic negative thoughts. Automatically, those negative thoughts come in our mind. So we have to pay a little careful attention as to what those negative thoughts are then these can be traced to your childhood. Uh, uh, maybe your uh, parents said something and that has got uh, embedded in your mind. And these keep on repetitively occurring. So you can uh, analyze these negative thoughts against real life that such and such thing did not re really happen to me. It is only in my mind that negativity is there. And then correct your misperception and replace them with positive thoughts. So this is a method of replacing negative thoughts with positive thoughts. And then another technique that has gained popularity from yoga is called as mindfulness. Is This is also somewhat related to gestalt that we talked about where we focus on the present or the now. So it is the awareness of the moment. And if you think about it logically, we do not have the past with us that is already gone. And we do not have the future with us that is also not present with us. All we have is the present. So we dwell in the present, we remain in the present, we focus on the present, and that is the essence of mindfulness. So anytime you are stressed, just bring your mind to the present and all your problems and worries will disappear. 
and then you can resume your activity. So take time to be mindful for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, whenever you are being bothered by stressors. Another approach which has been popularized by the work of uh, Seligman, uh, he, he has written a book on learned optimism. And uh, so looking at the bright side of things, so reduction of anxiety, making one aware of potential threats and avoiding them, improving coping, maintaining a positive mood. Those are all the benefits of being optimistic. So all of us uh, tend to be pessimistic from time to time. So we should uh, relinquish this habit, relinquish this type of an approach and become optimistic as far as possible. So there are three things that Seligman says that uh, problems are temporary. There is no permanent problem and optimism is permanent. You can develop a disposition of optimism. In any problem, you think of the optimistic way out of that problem. You know, one of my favorite shows is that of MacGyver. Uh, I don't know if they still play that show, but uh, MacGyver used to come out of any situation with his uh, improvisation. So uh, that type of an attitude we should have, you know, he was highly optimistic. And then failure says uh, is specific rather than universal. If you have failed in one particular area of life, that does not mean that you are a failure in all the other areas of life. So think of positive uh, things which you have accomplished and dwell on that positivity, dwell on those successes, dwell on those accomplishments. Every single human being has something that they have accomplished. There is no human being who is without accomplishments. So cherish your accomplishments. And then do not blame yourself for failures. Uh, instead, look for circumstances. Suppose you have failed, you were sick that, uh, uh, you failed a class, you were sick that uh, uh, semester or uh, uh, you, you, were, you were having too many things going on. So attribute your failures to outside events rather than owning responsibility of them. So that optimism is also a very potent means to dealing with stressors and coping with them effectively. And then we have emotional intelligence. Daniel Goleman came up with this uh, book, Emotional Intelligence, and uh, uh, he talked about five things. Self-awareness about uh, knowing one's emotions, mood management, self-motivation, uh, gathering up one's feelings and directing them to goals, uh, empathy, recognizing feelings in others, and managing relationships. Uh, so understanding emotions and not uh, uh, causing... Uh, 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 bad emotions uh, 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 to affect your relationships. So how do we apply this? So we recognize feelings in ourselves. Uh, so uh, uh, we should all constantly be aware whether we are sad, we are happy, we are uh, energetic, all those feelings we should pay attention to. Like uh, what kind of feelings are there in our mind? And uh, uh, we should recognize feelings in others. If I say some such and such thing, what kind of feeling it generates in X, Y, and Z. And care for others' feelings. Very, very important. We should not try to hurt others' feelings. As far as possible, we should try to uh, 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 not uh, cause any consternation in their uh, uh, feelings. And regulate feelings in yourself very important is we should not be affected. You did not get a pay raise, don't be upset with your boss. You work harder, maybe next time you will get a pay raise. Or uh, money is not everything. So you regulate your feelings in that way. So don't get upset. There is no point of getting upset in life. Life is too short. And harness feelings to achieve goals and improve relationships. So you work doubly hard. You did not get a raise this time. You work doubly hard. You work with your boss, you make uh, things, uh, make everyone happy around you. Sooner or later, you will get that raise. Don't just equate your success with money. So that kind of a emotional intelligence approach. So this is the summary. We talked about rational emotive therapy. We talked about simplified Kundalini Yoga. We talked about Gestalt therapy. 
He talked about systematic desensitization and specialized approach for dealing with fears. We talked about cognitive behavioral therapy. We talked about mindfulness. We talked about optimism. We talked about emotional intelligence. And uh, now I've opened up, opened it up for questions. So please go ahead. We have some time for questions. If you don't want to ask questions, you have my email. I'm available through email also. You can uh, open up your video. You can open up your uh, uh, mic. You can ask questions. This is the time or any clarifications, any comments. Liked anything, did not like anything. You can also express that. I know Blake is very unhappy with me. <laughs> Um, we do have one question uh, regarding the presentation. Um, if we can share the slides after the presentation, and um, I will be sending out an email with the recording, and then uh, Dr. Sharma, if I can share your slides. Yeah, you. I already sent you the PDF. Uh, yep. You do want me to send it again? Or, uh, no, I could go ahead and share that in the email that yeah, I sent out. Absolutely no problem. Please go ahead. And I have uh, uh, two books that I have written, If uh, one for the academic audience and one for the uh, 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 general audience. And let me share uh, those with you. So this is uh, the book, uh, uh, the Introspective Meditations for Complete Contentment, Santosh. And uh, this is a very popular book. So uh, yeah, uh, it is not that expensive. Uh, if, if you want a free copy, I can also send you a PDF of this book. Uh, you just have to email it to me and I can uh, email you a PDF. But if you want to have a hard copy, you can purchase it. It is uh, uh, available. I try to distribute it free. If you come to my office, I can give you a personal copy to keep. Uh, I just want people to benefit from what I've written in this book. My intention is not to make any money out of this book. Uh, all the, the uh, uh, money goes to uh, not for profit to disseminate more books. And then this is the academic book that I have uh, that I want to share with you. Uh, I, I think. Um, So this is uh, the academic audience. I uh, don't have that uh, link, but uh, it is published by Elsevier Practical Stress Management, a comprehensive workbook, which is in its eighth edition. And uh, this uh, particular book, uh, if you want to teach others or you want to do a bunch of work sheets, uh, it has uh, uh, several chapters uh, on time management, on relaxation, on communication, on anger management, and so on and so forth. If you want to complete those workbooks, worksheets, and all, then you can uh, go to this particular website. Let me see if it will let me go to this website. Uh, someone asked if your books are available at the UNLV library. Yeah, they are available at the UNLV library. This is that book, Practical Stress Management. This is a very popular book in academia. It is in its eighth edition. and. Uh, Several thousands of copies of this have been sold all over the world. So this is this was pretty expensive. Even with the thirty percent off, it is seventy dollars. And if you don't have any use for it, you can borrow it from the library. It is in several libraries also, and you can also see the older editions. You know those you can get on Amazon at more inexpensive prices. Perfect. Um, another question is: Do you have an audio book? Uh, I believe uh, that uh, practical stress management is in an audio form. I'm not sure um, uh, if they have done that or not. But that uh, general public book has been translated into Persian, if any one of you reads Persian, and a Spanish version is being translated. So uh, if some of your friends are uh, in Spanish, then it will be available soon in Spanish also. Great. Um, any last questions before we close the session today? 
Th thank you very much. I really enjoyed talking to you all and uh, uh, I uh, uh, hope you also liked uh, uh, my presentation and uh, uh, all the best in coping with the stressors. There is nothing like uh, 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 a stressor that we cannot cope with as human beings. So remember that and it is all in the perception. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Sharma. It's, it's nice to have uh, hear your, your techniques and your research and put it into action as we kick off a, a, a new year and a new and a, and the spring semester here at UNLV. So great tips. And thank you to all of you that joined us today. Um, hopefully you learned something and uh, got, uh, found this valuable. And um, we hope to see you back again with us on Friday, February 10th um, for an anthropologist goes looking for love in all the old places. Uh, presentation. So until then, I hope all of you have a great weekend and we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.